we're going to go to um, the individual presenters now and ask them for each for a concluding remark, what they'd like to end with or to leave us thinking about a question or maybe um, their key um, thing they'd like us to, to, to all think about uh, moving forward in what would be the one thing if you could um, encourage academics and practitioners and, and people and communities to do, um, any, anything you like. Um, so we'll, we'll do it in the order that the presenters um, gave their talk. So we'll start with Bronwyn and then we'll go to Roger and then we will go to Jill. So Bronwyn, would you like to start? Thank you, Amanda. Um, there's a number of things I could say, but I won't keep you for too long. I think one of the things that I would really would have concluded from my presentation is that um, the way things are in terms of the findings I've found where certain students get to stay in Leeds, they get to stay and have um, a collaborative um, experience with a sh in a shared house and other students don't, they go home and they may not live near any other students. That seems to me like um, a two-tier system and when you also look at who might want to do online masters in the future and who doesn't that again can start to look like a two-tier system where those who can't afford to come and stay in a university town and study full-time they do it part-time whilst studying it online and while working but it doesn't have to be a two-tier system. I think that so long as we are aware of the digital divide in terms of access and digital literacy, and we try to do as much as we can about that, it doesn't have to be a two-tier system. Online is not second class. It's a different way of learning. And I think it's about making sure that when online education is designed and developed, we always have an eye on quality. And I think as much as at least we might still have the digital divide, I think when we look at the courses that the Digital Education Service develops, they are very high quality and there are lots of um, checks in place to make sure of that. So I would end with a positive that online education can be an extremely positive experience, but we have to do more to make sure everybody has access to it. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so it's good to try and end on some positives so that's that's a really uh, great thing to take forward thank you Bronwyn. Um, Roger um, can I hand over to you now for a uh, one or two concluding remarks. Sure thanks Amanda um, I appreciate it um, and also thanks to everybody else that I've been able to listen to into uh, during the course of the evening. Um, I'm going back to that notion of the inclusive knowledge societies and uh, and wondering exactly what we mean by inclusive knowledge, inclusive knowledges, uh, and their place in new curriculums uh, for new times uh, post COVID. You know, how thoroughly have we thought this through in not just our attempts to reform the medium uh, or the, the the medium that we're that we're using for. Uh, transmission of education, but how thoroughly have we interrogated what it is that constitutes a new knowledge and how have we brought in um, the voices of many others, uh, the voice of Global South, uh, people from minority populations, uh, disabled people, First Nations and Indigenous and um, and, and so it goes. Uh, so that links to another um, thing that I, w I worry about in, uh, you know, the development of inclusive societies. I'm sure it's not the same in England. It, it couldn't possibly be. But in Australia, we live in a policy vacuum, uh, a leadership vacuum politically. Um, I know you have very good leadership in the UK. Um but uh, we're not so so fortunate. Uh, everything is done on the turn of a sixpence in terms of creating policy and ideas. And there's not much room for slow thinking, uh, for working through ideas and working through policy. And I'm not sure that that's uh, something that we've built in to how we do the business of, of learning. So if we're thinking about inclusive knowledge societies, I think we have to re 
interrogate those terms inclusive and and knowledge uh, a, a little further what knowledge is required for people to be able to negotiate a life you know, post pandemic um, so that's my first comment my second comment is is really on um, just very direct and that is you know what place uh, have we made uh, in the reform of our teaching and learning uh, for people with disabilities, for disabled people, uh, to ensure that their voice is heard, to ensure that they are giving leadership uh, to us, uh, to, to make sure that uh, the way in which we teach is accessible and that their quality of participation is improved. And I'm not sure that technology alone uh, provides the answer to that. It takes us a long, long way. But I think, you know, there, there's something else there. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Roger. That's fantastic. And I'll, I'll try not to be too political, but I think there's quite a lot of us in the UK that maybe don't feel we're being led terribly well at the minute. But I'll, I'll just leave <laughs> just leave that one there. <laughs> uh, and on that note, uh, Jill and Amelia. Uh, we would love to hear your concluding remarks as well. Thanks. I'll try and get it down to one remark. Um, I think for me, it's it's about not being scared. I think there's quite a lot of fear about talking to children, young people and parents um, generally um, within research um, and within policy and practice. And I think that's especially heightened when we're talking about issues of poverty and issues of exclusion. And I think there's this fear of offending that often stops people um, from having these conversations and doing this research and looking at, at how we listen and, and, and kind of understand the knowledge and experiences of children, young people and parents. But actually, because there is this fear that then stops some of this work happening, um, that just then leads to further exclusion and it leads to the um, kind of the acceptance that, that this is something to be ashamed about and this isn't so, that this is something that we don't talk about and that we can't talk to children about and we can't talk to, to parents about. Um, and so it further increases that divide and that gap. And I think um, that if we're going to, to really tackle some of these issues, we, we need uh, the, the policymakers and the, the researchers and the, and the, the practitioners um, to, to to not have that fear um, and to actually have a, have have that bravery of of putting themselves out there to to listen and to to learn and to understand to children, young people, and parents who have experienced poverty, uh, because unless we do that, then we're never going to to reach the place that we want that we want to reach. Fantastic, very inspirational, Amelia. Thank you, and very uh, very well put. Uh, so thank you once again to all the speakers and for your concluding remarks. That was that was really great and lots of um, lots of things for us to all go away and think about.